Hello, today is Thursday, April 18th, 2024. I'm Tony Mangino from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. With me today is Laura McDonald. Laura is a partner at LB3 and a regular guest here on our show. I'm excited because we have a special episode today. We'll be giving a eulogy to a corporation that has been a leader in the enterprise communications market for years. Laura, don't keep us in suspense. What's this all about? <laughs> Tony, eulogy might sound dramatic, but given the years that I've spent helping enterprises review, plan for, negotiate, and finalize contracts with AT&T Corp., I never expected AT&T Corp. to cease to exist. But that's exactly what's slated to happen next month. AT&T is quietly proceeding with a corporate restructuring that involves a series of internal transactions, which in AT&T's words, merges AT&T Corp. out of existence. Wait, what? AT&T Corp. has been around for decades. It's not just disappearing, is it? Well, no. As dramatic as that statement sounds, you have to take it into context and look at what's exactly happening. Well, please provide the context. Will do. Tony, first, a little bit of background. AT&T Corp., originally known as the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, or to some, Ma Bell, has provided wireline, voice, data, internet, and professional services to enterprise companies for decades. Heck, it's been providing voice services for over a century. Just a fun fact, there have been several times where AT&T Corp. has been the largest telephone company in the world. And it was incorporated in New York in 1885. So when I say decades and centuries, I mean decades and centuries. But after the breakup of AT&T, AT&T Corp. retained long distance and it spun off its baby bells. SBC, which was an original baby bell, repurchased AT&T Corp. in 2005. And knowing the value of the AT&T name, SBC changed its parent's name to AT&T Inc., AT&T Corp. remained a separate entity that was wholly owned and a direct subsidiary of AT&T Inc. And I'm sharing this not just because I'm a little bit of a telecom history geek, but also because it's important to, in understanding the new reorganization. So essentially, this is what's happening. AT&T Inc. created a new subsidiary, AT&T Enterprises Inc., earlier this year. And it plans on merging AT&T Corp with AT&T Enterprises as soon as it gets all the approvals it needs for its transaction. Then immediately after the merger, AT&T Enterprises Inc. will be converted to an LLC, AT&T Enterprises LLC, and again, in AT&T's words, not mine, AT&T Corp. will cease to exist. So let me get this straight. AT&T created a new Inc., which will become an LLC, and then AT&T Corp. will be swallowed by that entity. Why all the switching around? Well, that's a really good question. And really, Tony, you're asking two questions. Why is AT&T doing all of this for any reason? And why all the complicated organizational changes? So let me start with the second one, because that's actually a little bit easier. Under New York law, where AT&T Corp. was incorporated in 1885, you can't convert a corporation directly to a limited liability company. So this requires a multi-step process. First, the creation of a Delaware corporation, that would be AT&T Enterprises, Inc. Second, the merger of AT&T Enterprises, Inc. with AT&T Corp. And then making AT&T Enterprises, Inc. the surviving entity. And then ceasing the existence of AT&T Corp. Shortly thereafter, AT&T Enterprises, Inc. will convert from a Delaware corporation to an LLC, and that's going to be called AT&T Enterprises LLC. Okay, so why is AT&T doing this? That is the $74 million question. AT&T represents to various public service commissions that this corporate structure is more streamlined, and it'll enable AT&T to operate its businesses more efficiently. While AT&T Corp. is a direct tier one wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T Inc. and the new AT&T Enterprises LLC will be a fourth tier wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T Inc. It's still going to be in the same corporate family and wholly owned by AT&T Inc. And AT&T Inc. is pointing out that it has over 400 subsidiaries. But other than this efficiency statement, AT&T has been very reserved about sharing the rationale for this change. In fact, AT&T has been very quiet about this change overall. 
Perhaps it's because they are uh, embroiled in that cyber issue you spoke about two weeks ago. (laughs) Well, that's a real good hypothesis. But actually, this type of reorganization is something that has to be planned well in advance. So I don't think that's the primary driver of this reorganization or even the reason why AT&T is kind of keeping it hushed about the change itself. You know, it's kind of interesting. AT&T has made no flashy announcements about the change. Instead, just this month, they've started adding one line to all that boilerplate at the end of the invoices, which not very many people read, telling customers that effective May 1, 2024, any services provided by AT&T Corp will be provided by AT&T Enterprises LLC and assuring them that there will be no changes to rates, terms, or conditions of the service. Well, that's my next question. What happens to client contracts and our deals? Well, the official word of AT&T, or at least what it's telling regulators, and it's filed in a number of states to either get approval or to announce this change, they're saying that this is purely an internal ownership change. And that since the ultimate ownership of the entity by AT&T Inc. will not change, the restructuring will have no impact on the services offered either under tariff or contract. AT&T is also claiming that it'll be seamless to customers and that this, again, this is only pro forma. So, for example, you have to look at the filings. They're not all the same with the various states, but if you put them all together, you get a lot of information. AT&T told the South Carolina Public Utilities Commission that it intends to merge all of its assets, including accounts receivables, customer base, and authorization. And as I said, each of the various filings gives a little bit more information. What about financial support, staffing, and the like? Another excellent question. I don't know the answer long term. Obviously, when a company reorganizes for efficiency reasons, you would expect changes in those areas. However, AT&T has represented to regulators that the services will be, quote unquote, backed by the same technical, financial and managerial resources as they were receiving before the merger and that the same personnel who manage the services will continue to do so, so kind of implying there won't be some big layoffs, and that there will be no change in the network assets used to provide the services. Then when you look at some of the other filings that AT&T has made, it's included a representation that all accounts receivable, customer base, and authorizations will be merged into the new entity. It'll be interesting to see how AT&T spends this at the end of 2024 when it's doing its SEC filings and doing its investor conferences. But what it's saying right now is don't look, no big deal, ignore this. This isn't going to affect anything. So will AT&T notify its enterprise customers? Well, another good question. AT&T has represented to some of its regulators, for example, in Kentucky, that it will give customers advance notice of the transfer, but didn't say how. And other filings, it actually gave pretty much verbatim what I saw on the end of an AT&T invoice regarding, you know, the change as of May 1st. So it may be that's the only notice that people are going to get, at least until they have some new document from AT&T and suddenly it doesn't say AT&T Corp anymore. It says AT&T Enterprises LLC. Okay. What should enterprises that purchase service from AT&T Corp be doing? Tody, you know, I'm going to give you the lawyer answer. First and foremost, pull out your AT&T contract. See what it says. Check to see if you have provisions that you can use if things don't go according to plan. Do you have strong support language, SLAs and remedies, good insurance and notice clauses? Those types of things could come in handy now. And of course, check your assignment clause. Most assignment clauses allow a company to assign to an affiliate without approval, but they may require notice of any types of assignments or mergers and a specific time frame and method of notice. Has AT&T provided that to you if you have those types of provisions? And what are your internal invoicing and bill payment process? This is real practical. If an invoice arrives with a different name, will your systems recognize it and pay the invoice? If you are mid-contract, or about to do a renew or refresh, you may see new names appearing in the draft. So if you get an amendment, it may say AT&T Enterprises LLC, and that is different than your contract that says AT&T Corp. Make sure you work with your counsel to ensure the corporate restructuring is reflected in your documents and you track that through. And May 1st is just around the corner, so this is the time to reach out to your account team, ask to be briefed on what's happening, and how AT&T is going to make sure that this is seamless to you. Well, I guess AT&T continues to rethink possible here. Sorry, I I just couldn't resist. 
<laughs> no problem. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, I'm still smarting over the fact that at t abandoned Golden Boy, which was a specially commissioned corporate statute. And I won't go into that history. People can contact me if they want more. But, you know, I've been doing deals with at t Corp for ages and ages. In fact, I had an at t attorney correct a missing period at the end saying even at t has to end somewhere. So it's going to take me a while to get used to this. Thanks for sharing this today, Laura. And if our listeners are interested in keeping posted of any additional developments or you have questions, they can reach out to Laura, me, or any of our LV3 or TC2 colleagues. You can also stay current by subscribing to Staying Connected, by checking out our websites, and by following us on LinkedIn.